Just Mill here, Oxford College Physics. We're going to look at a nice problem. Here it is. We've got ourselves three long straight wires that are all parallel to one another, separated consecutively by 0.125 meters. We've got the top wire carries a current I1, 3 amps to the left. We've got the middle wire carries a current I2, 5 amps to the right. And then we've got this wire here that carries some current I3, yet to be determined. But we're going to ask some things about this. First off, <clears throat> what is the direction of I3 if the force per unit length distributed across I1 is equal to zero, net force per unit length? So, <clears throat> So, what is the direction of I3 if the net force per unit length on current carrying wire number one, so we'll just say F1 hat, sigma F1 hat divided by L is equal to a zero. So, what do we need for that to be the case, ultimately, is the question. Well, we think about what is the force per unit length in general magnitude of the force per unit length is IB times the sine of theta, where I is the current interacting with the magnetic field, and theta is the angle between the current and the magnetic field themselves. So in order for there to be some magnetic force exerted across wire number one, there has to be some magnetic field there. So this somewhat answers our question in terms of what do we need for the net force to be equal to zero? We need the magnetic field to be equal to zero because there's definitely a current I1. So we get this. If the total magnetic field across I1 is equal to zero, there will be no force per unit length exerted across it. And we're talking about magnetic force per unit length here. So that's it. So what do we have here? We've got that I2 produces a magnetic field locally. Let's look at the direction of the magnetic field that it produces along current carrying wire number one. So we've got the magnetic field produced by I2 is in what direction? Well, we've got I2's that way. We're looking up above it. So I crossed into R gives us the direction of B, which is out of the board. So all across this I1, we have this B2, which is out of the board. B hat. Two. So that is the magnetic field due to I2 along I1. Now we have this. If the net force per unit length across I1 is to be equal to zero, we need another magnetic field to cancel this one out, such that the magnetic field overall is equal to a zero. So we need this. Another magnetic field that is oppositional. What's that magnetic field going to be due to? It's going to be due to this current. So this is going to be our B hat 3, which then says, well, what direction does the current have to be in order to produce a magnetic field above it that's into the board? Well, if the current is going this way and we're looking up above it, the magnetic field is into the board. So that tells us straight up, hey, this current has to be going to the left. So we know that it is to the left if sigma f hat 1 divided by L is equal to 0. And that is basically part A there. We just wanted to figure out what direction do we need. Move on to part B. Just to quantify some stuff, ask some other questions. Hey, let's ask, what is the magnitude, or not even magnitude, what is the magnetic field across wire number one due to wire number two, and what is the force per unit length that wire number one produces across wire number two? So we've got to be a little bit careful of, but ultimately we've already figured out what the direction of the magnetic field due to wire number two across wire number one is. The direction's out of the board. 
so we can go ahead and start figuring out its magnitude. We've got the magnitude of V hat 2 at I1, current carrying wire number 1, is going to be equal to, well, what do we get? We've got ourselves mu 0 I2 over 2 pi R2. That is the magnetic field produced by an infinitely long wire. And that's the approximation that we're utilizing, a long straight wire. So mu zero i over two pi r is the magnetic field that it generates. We're talking about current carrying wire number two, it has five amps in it. And we're talking about this distance r2 being the distance from i2 to the location of space where we're trying to figure out the magnetic field is, which is 0 0.125 meters. So we can go ahead and say that this is going to be mu0 times 5 amps divided by 2 pi times 0 0.125 meters. And we get ourselves calculator. zero times 10 to the negative 6 Tesla. So there is the magnetic field, and we've already noted that it is outward. I'm going to throw in the direction there. So there's the magnitude, directions outward. And then we're also asked, what is the force per unit length exerted across wire number one due to only wire number two? So we're just taking away this wire number three for now and focusing on the interaction between I1 and I2. Well, again, the force per unit length is equal to the current interacting with the magnetic field multiplied by the sine of the angle between the current and the magnetic field. So we've got the current I1 interacting with the magnetic field B2. That's the interaction there. So when we're looking at the force per unit length, terms of a magnitude on I1 due to just I2, that is going to be equal to I1, that's the current, and B2, that's the magnetic field that it's interacting with, the magnetic field due to wire number two, times the sine of, we'll call it theta two, just to call it something. So we've got this, the direction of I1 is it that way? The direction of B2 at I1 is that way. What's the angle between them? 90 degrees. What's the sine of 90? 1. So we can go ahead and write right here. Theta 2 is equal to 90 degrees. So we've got that this just goes to I1 times B2. We know what I1 is. That's 3 amps. We know what a B2 is at I1. That's 8 times 10 to the negative 6. So we've got this, not that force, just regular force only due to I1, excuse me, due to I2 only. Force per unit length on I1 is going to be equal to I1 B2 which is 3 amps multiplied by 8 times 10 to the negative 6 Tesla, which we could call 2.4 times 10 to the negative 5. Amps times Tesla ends up being newtons per meter, as it should, both per unit length, newtons per meter. But what's left? We want a direction. This force distributed across it has a direction. So we want to know what the direction is. We're looking again at the interaction of this current that is to the left with this magnetic field, which is outward. So when we're looking at the force on a current carrying wire due to it being immersed within a magnetic field, 
we've got the direction of the force is substantiated by the cross product between the current and the magnetic field's direction. Current's going this way, magnetic field is out of the board, force distributed across it is upward. So we've got ourselves Upward force distributed across wire number one due to an interaction with the magnetic field generated by current carrying wire number two. The magnitude of that force is this. We can go ahead and finish this off and say this is upward. All right. So, one last question. What must current in I3 B in order for the net force distributed across wire number one to be equal to zero. So we're back to the original thing. We want the net force distributed across wire number one to be equal to zero. <coughs> what do we require then? We've already substantiated that we require that the magnetic field generated there overall has to be equal to zero. We know the magnetic field generated by wire number two is 8 times 10 to the negative 6 Tesla outward. So we need this V3 to be 8 times 10 to the negative 6 Tesla inward. We already know to make it inward, we just have that current I3 running to the left. And thus, we've got this. We've got for the net force per unit length, wire number one being equal to zero, we need sigma b hat at i1 to be zero. So we need that b hat 2 plus b hat 3 is equal to zero. This again is at the location of i1, which then just gives us that b hat 2 is equal to negative B hat 3. They just have to be in opposite directions. We've already figured that out. We got them opposing one another by putting, again, I3 to the left. And thus with this, we can go ahead and say, well, they have to have equal magnitudes. And the magnitude of B2 is 8 times 10 to the negative 6. Tesla. The magnitude of B3 has to be the same thing. So what do you figure out? Well, the magnitude of B3 at I1 is equal to mu0 I3 over 2 pi times R3. What's R3? R3 is the distance from the current I3 to the location in which we're deducing what the magnetic field is, which is the location of I1. What does that give us? R3 is equal to 0 0.250. 0 0.125 plus 0 0.125. There we go. So we know what everything is except for I3. We can go ahead and solve for it. So let us just do that. We've got then 8 times 10 to the negative 6. Tesla must be equal to mu0 times I3 divided by 2 pi times R3, which is 0 0.250 meters. That's great. Solve that out for I3. We've got ourselves that I3 is equal to 2 pi times 0 0.250 meters multiplied by 8 times 10 to the negative 6 Tesla divided by R mu 0. And this comes out to be, I already know, it is 10 amps. 10 amps to the left. How did I know it was 10 without calculating it? You may say because you've solved this out before probably, and you'd be right in that. But there's something that's pretty simple here in that the magnetic field is inversely proportional to the distance we are away from the wire generating the magnetic field. 
if we look at this, we've got ourselves that we are twice as far away regarding I3 than we are with I2. So if we want the same magnetic field at this location, and we're twice as far away, well, we need to double the current that's producing the magnetic field, because a magnetic field is proportional to the current and inversely proportional to the distance away. So we need to offset that. So we have twice as much current, 10 amps, we're twice as far away, 0 0.250 meters, we produce the same magnetic field. That's only because we have equidistances there, but ultimately, that's the way you get out. Put in your calculator, compute it, either way, that's that. So, if we go back and just make sure about something, that we're gonna get actually a downward force here. If we look at the magnetic field generated by wire number three, which is into the board, and it interacting with current carrying wire number one, you've got the force across current carrying wire number one due to it interacting with B3 is gonna be, current's going this way, we've got that the magnetic field is into the board, this blue one, we've got a force downward. And this would be F1 due to I3. The force distributed across I1 due to I3, which since it's the same magnitude of the magnetic field interacting with the same current, will have the same magnitude of force, they're in opposite directions, equal forces, opposite directions, cancel each other out, and that force is equal to zero. Done. That's it.